for um thanks aria well thanks everybody for joining us on this post uh, labor day day um, to look at uh, the housing affinity group how um, housing instability affects uh, people's ability to protect their health with HIV. I'm Kathleen Clannon, and I'm the medical director uh, for the health department in Alameda County in California, which includes Oakland and Berkeley and a number of other cities, and a longtime HIV doctor. And I'm the, the one of the, the faculty for this, uh, uh, for this affinity group. Um, very much interested in this issue because it's a huge one for Alameda County residents. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So um, today we're going to have a didactic presentation um, about, um, you know, kind of how to engage, you know, people who have uh, participated in quality improvement. Uh, we'll have a case presentation then by uh, Kamisha and Jeremy some discussion and wrap up. Why don't we go on ahead? Thank you for continuing to put your um, name and organization uh, into the chat. And why don't we go ahead to open it up for um, Dottie and Don. Good day, everybody, and good morning. I guess in some places, it is so good to be before you today. My name is Dottie Daldell, and I am a uh, faculty with uh, CQII and this um, Create Equ Equity Collaborative. And I'm excited to be here today before you. I am not by myself, thank goodness. I would love for my esteemed colleague and friend to introduce herself. Dawn? Good day, everybody. Um, same here, glad to be here. Um, and I am one of the CQII um, faculty also. I'm glad that you guys will uh, allow us to share with you today. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Dawn. Um, so good folks, today we're going to have a conversation on engaging people with a lived experience in quality improvement. But before we go into um, our didactic today, um, this will be a two-part um, series. Uh, this first part, we will talk with you a little bit about just changing the frame a bit when it comes to engaging people with lived experience. Um, we'll also have an example of um, how that was done at a particular clinic. And then the next time that we meet, we would love for you to come back with some of your experiences of engaging people with lived experience. We want to hear in the next session about some of your um, opportunities to learn as well as some of your successes. How does that sound good, folks? Can you just give me a thumbs up if that sounds okay? I see you, Mitchell. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thumbs without, up. go ahead. Does someone want to say something? I just said thumbs up. Thank you, Dottie. Oh, excellent. Thank you. So I can't see everybody. So please just, um, you know, unmute and, and say what you need to say. I only have a few squares on my uh, computer. So without further ado, let's get into it, shall we? Next slide, please. So I really, we would really love for you to just shift your thinking. Oftentimes when we think about engaging um, people with lived experience, we have a certain mindset or frame that we operate from. I wanted to just talk a little bit of how we can really shift our thinking when it comes to engaging people with lived experience. In some of my like previous work, I trained and I also developed curricula. Um, and I spent about maybe 10 or 12 years working in child welfare. And I would have, I would make this statement often when working with child welfare workers. How I see you is how I am with you. How I see you is how I am with you. Now I want us to think about that as we are talking about engaging people with lived experience. My question to you is how do you really see people with lived experience? Do you see them as partners in making quality improvements in your organization or your agency? My, th that's just one of the questions that I have for you today. How I see you is how I am with you. How do you see the people that 
you would love to maybe receive feedback from in order to improve the quality of your organization, your clinic, or your services. Next slide, please. So how we're going to shift our thinking today is I really want to borrow from the work of William Madsen. Um, he's done a lot of work as it relates to um, uh, multi-stress families, and he's the director of family-centered services in Massachusetts. And I love this particular framework because it helps me to understand the population that I'm working with and how I need to relate to them. Next. Um, Yes, so the relational stance is when you make the more general choice to consider how you relate to someone. Next slide, you can just go, thank you. So the attitude or the relational stance we hold with clients or our families, it's really the foundation of our effectiveness. The ways in which we think about our client or our conceptual models and the way that we act with our clients or our helping practices position us in particular relationships with them and can be evaluated in terms of their potential to support the relational stance we prefer to hold. So I want us to consider how, what is your relational stance with uh, the folks that you work with and for? Next slide, please. Uh, this stance is grounded in the spirit of respect, connection, curiosity, and hope. And oftentimes when we're eliciting information or feedback, do we come from a place of respect, connection, curiosity, and hope? And this is for us to just really evaluate where we really are when we are seeking to engage people with lived experience. Next slide, please. So the relational stance have, it has four elements, a belief in resourcefulness, engaging in the empowering process, working in partnerships, and striving for cultural curiosity. And we're going to break down each of the four elements. And then we have a great treat for you today um, as it relates to a, a, a real world example of what that looked like in practice. Next slide, please. So when we talk about a shift in resourcefulness, right, and thinking about the way that we see the folks that we work with and for. When we enter a culture, what we look for profoundly organizes what we see. All clients have particular competencies and know-how as well as capacities to grow, to learn, to change, to give us feedback on our services. Our work proceeds quicker and elicits less resistance when we focus on what is and could be. So in the belief of resourcefulness, we're shifting the emphasis of the problem to the emphasis on the competence. What would it be like for us to see the people that we work with and for from a place of competence and not from a place of they are the problem? Next slide, please. The second element is engaging in the power, empowering process, shifting our role from I am the expert. How many experts do we have with us today by the show of hands? It's not a trick question, good folks, as folks are looking the other way. Um, we want to shift our role from expert to accountable ally. And the empowering process refers to ways of thinking and acting that acknowledge, that support, and amplify people's participation and influence in developing the lives they prefer. Disempowering processes refer to ways of thinking and acting that inadvertently disqualifies, constrains, or um, supplant people's participation and influence in their lives. How do we shift from that place of expert to now the accountable ally? Next. Hey, Daddy. Yes. Um, this is Dr. Clinton. Yes. So I, I always... I struggle with the word empowering because it implies that as, you know, as workers, we can somehow give power um, to, you know, to our clients and patients. Mm -hmm. And I just, I want to, I want to, I, I really want to hear your thoughts about that word and what it means. Because I think all of us really think of it as help, uh, as working with people in a way that helps them uncover their own power, which is different than a transfer of power from us to them. I would really love your thoughts on that. Yes, that's a very good question. And when I'm thinking about the empowering process, it's, it's, we understand that in certain relationships, when we're talking about um, working in the helping field, if you are the person that is in the professional role, if you will, there's a certain element of power. 
right? There's a certain element of power that you have, and it's not about transferring that power, but how can we identify the power within the particular client as it relates to quality improvement, right? Like how do we connect and relate to the client in such a way where we help them identify that they have some things that they could offer to us to help us to improve our systems and our services. May I tag in? Please. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm up here never to get a hit Little River Medical. And my yes. engagement, engagement with the client, uh, what she was saying about the empowering, I let them know that I was once where they are, you know, sitting in that seat that I used to be my own problem. Mm. You say about the stances, mm -hmm. um, I, I used to be my own problem until I was empowered uh, spiritually with hope, with confidence, with belief that I too can make a difference, become a part of the solution and not the problem, which that problem was for me. I have five years, eight months clean from drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. and, and I'm undetectable. I let them know that I was once in that seating position, you know, um, diagnosed with full-blown AIDS, went through the motions, went through the motions. So whatever they may be feeling, um, that in, that transferring, so to speak, of my positive energy. And I've had we've had I've had plenty of feedback from the clients that I've met that that I and a couple of uh, other staff members have made their day just by being in their presence and and feeling joy from our face unto theirs mm -hmm. that's kind of that's kind of what i wanted to tie in with that that is that they see that spiritual connection where mm -hmm. okay this young man this man's got joy you know if if he can have joy from all what he's gone through maybe there's hope for me mm -hmm. and that's what i wanted to tag in and say about transferring um some uh uh instilled joy for me to our clients. Yeah, I really, really, so this is uh, Dr. Klanig and I wanna yes. really lift up what Mr. Pierce has just said. Cause I think there's this focus, you know, th there is a medical, you know, in the medical culture, there's a focus on problems. There really is. And what I hear from Mr. Pierce is uh, empowering really is inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's inspiring. And yes, ma'am. There's, there's no way you can give your own power to someone else. You can help them recognize it and you can inspire them to say, you can, you know, that I made it and you can too. Exactly, doctor. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I, I really think that that's the, you know, the, the critical piece of engaging people with lived experience. There are many community health worker programs that hire you know, young people from communities, but they have not had these experience, mm -hmm. experiences. You know, the, the difference of hiring someone with lived experience from someone who's a, someone from that community is as somebody who can actually inspire, as Mr. Pierce is saying, who can say, I did this and you can too. And I, I do believe that that's an extraordinarily powerful uh, intervention and one that's extremely difficult to measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think, uh, Dr. Clannon, what we see is maybe the byproduct of that, right? While it may be hard to measure, what would it look like for us to work with people in such a way where they understood the power of their voice to make change into syst in systems and service provision, right? When we think about that, while we may not be able to uh, um, quantify like say joy or resiliency, right? But we see what happens when a person is operating from that place where a person with lived experience may not know what to do with their story or how to, you know, or how, or in fact, if they could provide feedback on service provision, but once we help them to identify, um, identify that and then use it to make change, it is a part of the empowering process. So it's not about us giving our power over, but it's really about helping people to identify the power that they had in order to make change, the power of their voice, the power of their lived experience, if that makes sense. Next. 
give me one second, good folks. So we've talked about um, engaging in the empower, empowering process, shifting our role from expert to accountable ally. I would like for us to now focus on the second element of the relational stance, which is working in partnership. And it's shifting our work from professional turf to the person's turf or arena. Um, next slide, next. Yes, if we believe that people are the experts on their lives and often have more resourcefulness than we realize, our work together can become a collaborative process that draws on the skills and the know-how of both parties. So the goal is to develop a cooperative relationship in which the person is an active participant. Cooperation is a two-way street and helpers as well as families or clients can be non-cooperative. And we've seen that in our own lives as well as the lives of the people that we may work with. Since we as helpers hold a leadership position in the relationship, a collaborative relationship begins with us finding ways to cooperate with our clients and fit our work to their turf or their arena. What does that mean? That sometimes it may not always happen between the hours of nine and five that we may have to find creative ways to elicit information and feedback from our, uh, from our clients. The third element is shifting from cultural curiosity. Shifting, and this is like my favorites, shifting from teacher to learner. Because the, more, the older that I become and the more information that I receive, the more I realize how much I do not know. <laughs> Uh, next, thank you. Clients and helpers can be seen as distinct cultures, each with beliefs and preferred styles of interacting. Services can be seen as cross-cultural negotiation in which clients and helpers interact in a mutually influencing relationship. In this interaction, the client actions may be more understandable through the client's lens than through the helper's lens. To fully understand individual complexity, it is useful to approach each person as a unique microculture and to learn as much as possible about their particular culture. We can think about approaching each client as an anthropologist, looking to elicit the client's meaning rather than assigning professional meaning. This endeavor can be supported by entering with a stance of not knowing or cultural curiosity. And it takes a bit of humility to sit in the seat of a learner, especially when you know that you have a wealth of information that could be beneficial. Oftentimes it takes that level of humility to be able to have a whole seat <laughs> and hear what it's like for the, the client that's going through our service from their perspective. Next. So before, so we've identified um, four of the elements of uh, William Matson. Now I would love to give you um, an example of how some of the concepts that we just went over was demonstrated in this particular project. And Dawn is going to lead us in that direction. And it's panties off for Pat Smear's project. Dawn? Thank you. Um, so, you know, we we're thinking about how to engage consumers, um, you know, what are ways to engage them. It made me think about in my journey um, years ago to how I became involved in HIV services. Um, in the clinic that I was a part of at the time, um, you know, at the time, I, the farthest thing from my mind was being active at HIV care. That's not something that I saw for myself. Um, the social worker that worked with me um, decided and asked me that I want to go to a training. Um, and he basically just said to me, you know, it'll, it'll teach you how to, you know, help you help yourself a little more. And so I went and they sent me to a TCQ. And I went to California and I took this three day training. And when I came back, I was a different person, right? My mind was on fire and I just knew that I had to do something. And so I asked, could I? volunteer, you know, some way be in support, you know, in the clinic. Um, and so they, they agreed and they allowed me to come in once a week um, on a Tuesday to kind of um, remind and support the patients that came in for their care that day. Well, actually on that particular day, it was the day that the women came in for their GYN appointments. Um, I remembered hearing a story from the TCQ about a way that a clinic had gotten their GYN numbers up um, in their clinic. So I went to the director and I said to him, listen, 
I noticed that a lot of the people aren't showing up for their GYN appointments. Do you know why? You know, do you know what's stopping it? And, you know, he said to me, you know, that's a good question. Um, and so we talked about it and I said to him, listen, I have an idea. Um, I heard about this program um, and, you know, they were giving their clients underwear and we talked about it and I was like, you know, yeah, we could do like panties off of pap smear. So I just kind of threw that name out there. And he was like, gosh, that sounds catchy. And so what I would do is the clinic took a hundred dollars. I don't know where they got it from. And we went and we bought all these beautiful pairs of underwear and all the different sizes. And when the ladies would come in for their visit at the end of their GYN visit, I would come in, introduce myself to them and give them a free pair of underwear. Also, when I would call the ladies to remind them of their appointments, I would tell them, listen, and when you're done with your pap smear, you, you get a free pair of underwear. And I never thought that just telling somebody they were going to get a free pair of underwear would have them come back. Um, so, of course, you know, I had to keep data. I had to keep numbers to see what patients were coming back the following year. And a lot of the ladies that came back said they came back because they wanted another pair of underwear. So this was just a way that the clinic was able to engage me and I was excited about being engaged. But anytime I think about this program that they allowed me to be a part of and, and, and do in the clinic, if they would have never asked me the first thing to go to this training, I would have never thought of ever becoming active in HIV care as a peer or any of the work that I do. And so it always makes me think about when I hear someone saying, I don't know how to get um, someone with lived experience involved. I don't, you know, I've asked and, you know, no one's uh, coming up or we're always using the same people. And my question to you is, have you asked every single patient in the clinic? Because if you haven't asked everybody, you haven't engaged everybody. And I know we automatically assume because maybe of the person's lifestyle or what we think they, their living is like that we don't ask them. But sometimes it just takes that one question or maybe you put it on an intake form um, and ask that question about, you know, whether you'd be willing to be a part of, you know, a quality improvement project. So um, next slide. So then we were talking about what kinds of involvement. So, you know, there's the serve, you can always have surveys um, that can be done during a visit, after a visit. Um, then you have the improvement quality teams where they do the improvement projects. Um, maybe you have um, consumers come in and you ask them some questions to see what they think could be changed. Um, you have consumer advisory boards where that is where I started out at. I, came to be a part of the Consumer Advisory Board uh, in the beginning, planning groups, um, and volunteer. I started volunteering, and when I volunteered, at first it was just volunteering. Eventually, they offered me a $50 stipend a month, and to me, that was just okay, you know, um, and I did the reminder calls. Um, when I started at the position I'm in now, I started a women's group. Um, and then again, the collecting data was what I did with the uh, pap smears, uh, the program with the panties off of pap smears. So there's so many different ways that you can involve consumers. Um, again, I always just say you have to ask. Um, next slide. So compensation or... Um, so as soon as you say this, um, people always think, you know, how, you know, how do I get them to want to come and volunteer or be a part of or do anything that we might need them to do to get their input? And automatically, we almost always assume that it has to be money. And yes, for some people, that's what they need, right? They need money. They need a visa card to maybe pay their phone bill that month. But not all the time is that what it is. Um, you know, sometimes it can be full or part-time work they're looking for or consultant work. Maybe they just come in every now and then when you need them. Maybe they, they're looking for education credits. Um, you know, maybe they're almost at the end of their, their college degree and they just need some extra credit hours. That's something you may be able to give them if you have that, right? The trainings and the conferences, the TCQ I went to. You know, that was awesome for me. You know, I got to learn all this great information. I was able to connect and network with all these new people. And on top of that, I had a free trip, right? Everything was paid for. So that was awesome for me. Again, everybody's going to be different. 
And then you do have some people who would like to get a gift card, right? Whether it's $25, $50, because they need some basic needs, right? You never know. They may need laundry detergent, you know, whatever they need in their house. But I always say just be creative, think out the box, and don't assume that you know what every person needs. Yes, maybe 80% of people would like to have a gift card, but maybe somebody else would just be willing to use your gym that you have in your facility. Hey, here's a two month membership to our gym. If you help us with this uh, project that we have. Next slide. So any questions or comments? And you know what, before we go on to the questions or comments, Dawn, first of all, thank you for that. And I'm even thinking about when we talk about be creative, sometimes it's about us asking what folks need and what, we, what would be beneficial for them. Absolutely. Okay, so I love the CEU. So oftentimes we think in that mindset because, because we have some experiences in working with folks in the community and we think gift cards are across the board. But what happens if you were to ask someone, they said, you know, I was thinking about maybe building my resume and I, I can use some of the CEUs or some of the trainings that you offer in your organization. It's really about us asking the question. And when it comes to even the survey, what would, what would it look like to um, elicit the information from people who have lived experience as we're developing the survey, right? Uh, including them in the beginning stages of the creation of some of the surveys. I just wanted to put that out there for your, for your consideration. What questions or comments do you have? I want to jump in real quick because I think we're at um, a powerful crossroads with a lot of our sites getting into the concrete action planning of their intervention. And some of these interventions have incentives or maybe these sort of like miscellaneous things, you know, pillboxes or whatever. And so sites are saying, all right, uh, how are we gonna fund that? <laughs> when we're asking that question, wouldn't it be smart of us to also say, we have our liaisons. Have we asked them, you know, what's value adding to you? And maybe it's going to be professional development. Maybe it's going to be seeing their ideas taken seriously and implemented tangibly. But if we're trying to find a resource, you know, that's outside of a Part A grant or a Part um, C or B dollars, it makes sense to say, well, we should include the folks with lived experience that are participating in this co-design, because maybe that that same um, funding stream can add value to both components. And that's not something I thought about until, uh, until Don, what you just said. So I wanna really say thank you. I had not thought about that. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, because again, like Dottie said, this is what we've done for so long, right? So you just automatically go to that thought process. And I think if agencies start thinking a little bit out of the box, they'll come to learn that not everybody has to have this monetary thing. Mm -hmm. And some agencies have gyms. Some agencies offer their online trainings that can be used during college credits. Again, if you don't ask these things, right? And you don't, and you don't stop assuming, you probably are missing out on a lot of awesome people that could get you some information that you never thought about. Any other questions or comments? I know we are probably just about I would like out of time. To, I would like to mention something. Uh, my name is Adeline, and I'm with, um, from the Family Healthcare um, Worcester. Um, and another thing that I wanted to add to the, the human needs, it's um, we need to also consider like the um, physiological like food, like safety, like shelter. Um, also their sales actualization. We need to find out their emotions too, because if their emotions are unbalanced, we need to find out what, how we can control them or how we can balance a little bit so like that we can intervene. Because if they're very hurt or emotional distress, we cannot do any intervention like that. So we need to find out like, like Maslow, you know, the five um, um, hierarchy of needs, you know, their you know, motivational theories that he had. I usually follow him a lot because 
I'm working right now and finding like, uh, I noticed that with my experience, finding if they're homeless, when you find them a, a place, even a, a room, a SOS, you can actually work better with them in some cases, not all, but so in most of the cases you can work because they feel they have something they can call home. And you know, the medication will be in a stable place. They're not as you know, stigmatized like when they're homeless, that they cannot leave their bag because they always in the shelter, you know, they they steal them. So I, I feel that using that pyramid for me it works. Um, and I think that also encouraging trust when you do the initial assessment, because if you don't encourage trust, you're not going nowhere because they've been out there. They've been, you know, discriminated by a lot of people too, and they're stigmatized. They feel like on safety. Sometimes they feel their emotions are so, so distressed and you need to start working with them. And once I think um, from my background experience that I think that, that those are the fundamentals um, factors that I always guide myself through the intervention and the plan that I Adelina, use. Adelina. Yeah. So this is Dr. Clan, and you you talked about you know about how you talk with people about trust in the in the first uh, meetings. I agree with you completely that bringing people into a safe place makes such a difference. It allows people to literally lay down their burdens you know the things they've been bringing with them but but also to some extent their psychological burdens of safety yes but you said you have to build trust from the beginning how do you do that what does that look like well when you you kind of like study their gestures and 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 you offer yourself to them and you say you want to talk about it or you want me to find someone to talk about it, a coach, don't mention psychiatric, but just say somebody who, you know, we have on, on house that, you know, she's a coach. You, because sometimes you don't, we don't know who the type of patient, the, the mental health, if they haven't taken, you know, if they have schizophrenia, if they have um, bipolar and they're very insecure of their mental health, or they've been so stigmatized by the people calling them, especially in the different cultures, learning about culture and Spanish culture, you know, a loco is a, a, you know, it's a word that, you know, oh, she's crazy or, you know, that's, they don't, they still, we still have that stigmatization with, when it comes to mental health. So I think rephrasing the way that you express and project yourself with them, I think that's the nicest way. And also learn about their education too, because sometimes we we think we, we're dealing with professionals and medicine is another culture, it's another terminology. Be basic with them that they can understand. We're dealing with people that sometimes their, 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 their education is very elementary. So you need to lower yourself to that level of education that they have so they can understand you better. Because if you stay in the, you know, they will, they will say it like Spanish, they will say yes, yes, but they don't understand. You leave them lost like they just came. Just ask them in a nice way. I think the proper manner that you project to yourself in such a friendly way that you can give them options. Always, the patient always has the right to decide what they want. But if you don't put the options out there, how are they gonna choose you know, what option they have? If you don't put out there the services or ask them, what is the first thing that you need that I can help you? I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to hold your hands. Let's walk together this pathway. Or things will get better day by day. That's my, my, my biggest saying today. Day by day, today's another day, tomorrow's a better life. We'll see you come out. And you know what, Adelina, what, what you're saying, thank you. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that. What, what, what I'm reminded of as, as you were speaking is even when you're offering the services, right? <laughs> like also asking folks at the, maybe the end of service or the beginning of the next service, like how was that for you? Yes. Right, regardless of where folks are, they can tell you how it felt to be treated by you, right? Or, or the services. So being open and, and, and open and humbled 
with them providing the feedback, regardless of and where they sure. are. They could, you, like, how was that for you? When I referred you to that particular agency, how was it? You know, I know you made the phone call or I know you set up the appointment. Can you tell me a little bit more about your experience? Because it's really about us improving our programs for the benefit of the community that we serve. Yeah, and I think also- when we, um, Thank you. Telling them, I'm sorry. Thank you, Adelina. Them, sharing and, and also be grateful every time that they accomplish their objective, be be proud of them and let them know I'm so proud of you. You this is, oh my God, Absolutely. you impressed me. I'm so impressed. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much for that re really rich discussion, Adelina. <laughs> Um, can we go ahead and put the slides back up again and see where we're transitioning to? Thanks. So as we're transitioning, Dr. Clinton, I just want to say thank you all. Uh, that is That concludes our didactic for today. But next week or next time when we come back, I would love to hear more uh, about some of your experiences in engaging um, some of the folks that you work with and for. Thank yes, you. Daddy. Thank you very much. Bye. Spectacular as always. Thank you, Dottie. Um, so let's go ahead and move on. So we've got about 20 minutes left uh, for Kamisha and Jeremy. Um, so why don't you go ahead um, and get started and we'll see where we go. Sure, so it was fine listening to the conversation. Um, I wanted it to keep going and we could keep going forever. Essentially, what we wanted to present today was, um, it's basically an extension of what Dottie and Don presented from CQII standpoint, as far as what we are doing when it comes to engaging persons with lived experience. And so I love Dottie talked about shifting your, our thinking and seeing how we can have different approaches to engaging persons with lived experience. I'm not gonna put up, um, I think maybe I have one or two slides, but just to have the conversation, keep it going. So update you all and let us know where we are with things as far as the affinity group space that we have for persons with lived experience. If you are with us on learning session two or have been with us from the beginning, you know that it's one of the expressed, um, uh, it is expressed that one of your, the requirements, or if you will, for being a part of the collaborative is to engage persons with lived experience as part of your QI team. And in doing so, we want you to provide opportunities for involvement and growth for those persons that you have identified um, through resources. You support them through resources and guidance so that they'll be able to fully understand you know, what, what their roles are um, as being part of your team and also have them to have meaningful roles, not just to you know, check the box until we have someone on our team, right? And we have, of course, we have QI coaches that is able to uh, assist with implementing your QI projects, as well as strategies to engage um, individuals with lived experience. As Dottie and Don noted, so many different points, so many different strategies, um, and there are different ways of engaging, not just to have um, advisory boards or not just with incentives, it's not just monetary. You can find other creative ways to, um, to compensate. And for some people, it's just to say, um, to be proud of the fact that they're part of a project, like Don mentioned being um, the pride that she felt in being engaged to be a part of a project that she, she was able to give the idea and have ownership of that. So we at CQII, we continuously have persons who live the experience as part of our advisory boards, on our staff, faculty, um, to be able to help us to plan some of our activities around not only the collaborative, but CQII activities as well. And so um, as part of this collaborative, as you know, as you may know, we have the consumer, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the person, the PWH liaison, Affinity Group Space, all the acronyms and alphabet soup, but we have an Affinity Group Space for individuals with lived experience to be able to um, feel supported, to voice any concerns that they may have, and to let us know, you know, how we can assist them along the journey that they are currently on. And so one of the things we did, we had prior to the start of the trainings, uh, on the sessions, we had trainings, and they included um, trainings around QI tools, around surveys, interviews, um, journey mapping, uh, flow charts, diagrams, things of that nature, um, to be able to expand capacity, um, increase capacity for those individuals that are part of the affinity group space. Not only that for them, but to be able to have a better understanding of um, the tools. So as the language is being spoken, as they're seated at sitting at the tables, that they understand what's being spoken of when it comes to the data. So the affinity group meets every month and our next session will be on next Thursday, the 16th at 1 p.m. Um, and like I noted before, it's our, we would love to see as many of our sites be a, a part of this group space. And of the 63 or so active sites, we maybe have 
I would say about 15, and I think I'm being generous, 15 to 20 that we have seen um, let us know that they have a person as their um, lived experience on their QI team, whether they are involved in the um, planning or they're just being sent to the meetings. Uh, we would love to see individuals, an uptake in that number as far as engaging individuals. So if you have not, or if you don't know if your team has, just take it back to the group and say, hey, who is our person who have experienced this on our team? And as you noted before, as being part of the housing group, for example, it's not necessarily someone who has struggled with um, housing instability. It could just be someone that's able to successfully engage and have conversations with and um, bring back feedback to and from rather the community to be able to um, inform um, your decisions when it comes to your QI projects. Um, what else are we? And so what we do is it's like we said, it's a group for and by persons with living experience. So our first session in June, we essentially had um, folks on who informed us of some of the things that they are struggling with, some of the topics that they would like to see us cover. And so we built our um, agendas for the following sessions based on that. So in sept um, next week, our, we'll be focusing on data because one of the questions that came up was, okay, I'm pulling my data, I'm part of my team, I'm seeing the data, but I don't understand it. I don't know what to do with it. So we're going to have, um, Adam is going to come in and he's going to talk through with us some of the um, data visualization and things like that. And just looking at the data, being comfortable with it. Uh, so since I was a concern for some of the individuals that joined us for that session, some other um, topics that came up were um, harm reduction strategies and tools and engaging or re-engaging individuals during this time of um, virtual um, working with COVID and everything. So our next few sessions will be focused around those topics that came out of the conversation that we had in our um, first session. And just a reminder, like we said, involving individuals who have experienced uh, as a liaison is like just in, make sure that they're engaged in a planning phase. I'm going to just share the one slide that we, Jeremy and I, thought was very um, important as a reminder. If you're part of learning session two, you would have seen this, but it's essentially just reminding us all to engage individuals who live experience from the beginning, not just after your planning and then now to be a part, but that they're actively involved in your, in defining what the project look like and what their roles are, make sure it's meaningful and that they're engaged in the community as part of the um, community, make sure that they are given opportunity to provide feedback and to give any um, input that they have on the interventions that are being um, put forth. And then from the pers provider's perspective, um, make sure that we are, are reporting and communicating back to community some of the things that we are doing and to be sure that they are in the know at all times as to what's happening and providing support to those liaisons, whether it's through resources, through guidance, or just con um, connecting them with the right people that they're able to have to do their job successfully, their tasks successfully. So those are just some of the things that we are doing here at CQII. And this is part of the collaborative, like I mentioned, but beyond the collaborative, we still do other trainings, webinars, and things around engaging persons with lived experience. And so we thought it'll be part of the conversation as far as um, what Don and Dottie presented today, it would be helpful to just present where we are right now and to see if there are any questions from you all about engaging folks on your QI teams. So with that, I will open it up and see if there are any questions um, or any comments uh, around whether what Don and Dottie presented or where we are with CQII as far as our affinity group space and other resources. Hi, Kamisha. This is Travis from Kansas City. Um, earlier, the TCQ Plus training was mentioned, and I know that had been done in person pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Is there any mm -hmm. updates on whether that will eventually be offered like virtually or yeah. um, other suggestions? So the TCQ plus is no longer in our wheelhouse, so to speak. So her said they went, they decided to try to pull together a lot of their, um, their, their different um, consumer involvement activities. They tried to bring it under one entity and TCQ plus one, was one of those things. And so it's not with us anymore. So I can't speak to when they will be offering it, the, the organization that was able to get that award. But what I can say is that we do have now a series of virtual trainings called Learning Labs. And one of them is a experience-based co-design. It's similar in the sense that the TCQ Plus was one where we invited 
providers as well as persons with lived experience to come together to look at how they can improve um, the quality of services at their agencies or overall. And so this is what the experience-based co-design learning lab is slated to do, and that is virtual. So we have wrapped up with the um, development of that training, and we are now interested in having it be reviewed by HAB, HRSA HAB, and we will announce shortly when that will be kicking off. So that's something definitely that we would encourage um, individuals to sign up with as a team and more, more to come on how you can sign up and also encourage you to sign up if you are interested in the beginner learning lab or other course offerings as well. And there's are all virtual, like I mentioned. Well, so Travis, it never hurts to have, you know, the customers who, who essentially you all are very important customers um, to give feedback to HRSA to say, this is something that we really feel that we need and want it in this particular format. It does make a difference. It's astonishing how much it makes a difference. Absolutely. Anyone else? I saw Jamie, Jamie, I saw a comment about those that had missed opportunities. Definitely excellent point about improvement, you know, looking at how we can improve on that process and even asking for feedback from individuals that, you know, we missed including you early. What are some of the things that you would have included or moving forward? How can we improve on, you know, on that effort? Great point. One thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, people with lived experience, typically they're, you know, if you're hiring them into a, a hospital or small government uh, organization, which are the, the two kinds of places I've worked, typically will be described as community health workers, sometimes community health outreach workers, but something around that. And um, in California, I know, I'm not sure how broad based this is, but in California, there is now um, an openness to actually having the work of people in those job classifications uh, to be billed for as, you know, as providers. Uh, there's still a lot, you know, it's a, it's a piece of legislation. And so we need to kind of, you know, get, get clarity about exactly what it is that they're talking about, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, but, I'm, but I'm wondering about whether any other states you know, are, are, you know, are in that process of trying to figure out how do we fund these activities? Because, you know, in managed care, essentially, uh, you want people to come not to the emergency department, but to a primary care site. And what makes that happen is because people have a friend, a person they trust at a primary care site. Um, and so it's, it, there's really a reliance, a leaning uh, to make that whole model work. There's a reliance on people being able to make a connection, a heart connection, as well as an intellectual connection with the primary care site. And that's where I think that people lived experience is absolutely essential. So interested in whether any other states besides California are uh, engaging around this issue. Hi, this is Rose, and I know in Phoenix, um, kind of based on some of the conversations that we've had, both from learning session two and then from some of the learning collaborative groups, um, they're proposing to HRSA in their next budget for a peer navigator to be placed in the biggest primary care clinic in Phoenix so that um, folks can have that opportunity to engage with um, the peer navigator prior to or after their visit with the um, provider so that they can develop that relationship with, um, with that person so that if they had questions that they might be afraid to ask or if they think about something after the visit, they have somebody that they can engage with who can help them reconnect with the provider as needed. And um, I really appreciate having the opportunity of hearing everybody else's experience because I think that's really helped um, the, um, the team approach the project officer and seems like um, they're getting positive feedback that that would be approved. Anyone else? 
just wanted to add that uh, in New York State, there is an initiative to certify community health workers, and that's probably the first step to getting folks um, funded. Some certification, some standardization of, of training and recognition of you know, the skills that people have. Um, so that's going on in New York State. The other thing I wanted to mention about funding is actually I wrote a grant for a community health worker program, and it was funded by Part B pharmaceutical rebate uh, dollars, which is not permanent, kind of fluctuates, but if you have access to that, you might think about that as a stepping stone to kind of get a program initiated, um, and then hopefully it can be integrated into other funding cycles. Um, but that's one, one way to take a look at it. Hey, this uh, is Rose again. In Phoenix, um, they were able to use some of their um, EHE funds to um, put together a curriculum for- I'm sorry, um, Rose. Health there, workers and there what kind of funds? Can you spell it out? The, and, the, and the epidemic funds um, that um, they were able um, to develop a curriculum that was based on the state certification of community health workers. And um, they are in the process right now of having a program and their goal was to get um, between 10 and 12 individuals with lived experience who would um, be able to go through that program and then um, have those folks then um, kind of be the pool of folks that they could pull from for um, for various positions in the community that could be funded. Thanks, Rose. Hi, uh, this is Michael from uh, Massachusetts. Um, so we, Massachusetts has um, started their um, certification of community health workers. They have a board that exists for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health um, for all those certifications now. So we are, are moving in the right direction to be able to build for those as well. Michael, one of the things that I that I think is a super important distinction, which is not always made, is between, you know, the, the young things who are on their way to medical school or nursing school versus people who have lived experience. Um, and, and those are the two kind of general populations that end up being community health workers. Um, and I, you know, there, there, there are really good roles for both. Um, but, I'm, but I'm wondering, are you seeing any sensitivity to the difference between people with lived experience versus those who are on their way to healthcare careers? Um, I, I, from the community health center level, I would say a lot of our uh, community health workers are lived experience. They're all um, members of their community. Um, I know when our peers, you know, we try to get them to be to apply for CHW or another certification at least. Um, so we try to push in that direction. So we basically hire someone for their experience first, and then we worry about getting in their community health worker um, certification later. Got it. But I was thinking kind of of the effort to certify at the state level. Do you have any sense of whether, is there, oh. is there a distinction being made between community members versus people with lived experience, which is, which in my experience is really a critical difference. I don't know if others have had that same experience. Yeah, I would say like in the, at the state level, it would be like grant wise for the HIV, obviously always HIV work, um, but I'm not sure beyond that um, if they do that. Hi, I'm Mitchell, I'm a, the peer Thank advocate you. at Family Health Center of Worcester. Um, I'm actually certified at, through the Mass Par uh, Department of Mental Health as a P uh, CPS, Certified Peer Specialist. So it was a little bit different than working directly in, in the HIV field, but, and, um, but I think there was a lot of really good um, stuff to bring back to the community and back to the, the work that I do. Um, it's really about holding space for people. And I, I really appreciate the, the way that the um, Department of Mental Health, because um, they, they're dealing with um, or working with people um, with disability and other like physical and mental health disabilities. So it's a little bit different, but I think it's, there's a lot of similarities and I wish that um, 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 DPH would do similar work um, to kind of further into like self-determination, those three pillars of CPS. So we're Dr. coming to the end of our uh, hour actually. Dr. Can Kathleen. Gotta... Please go ahead, Robert. Okay. Um, from okay, from my identification with my position 
as a peer navigator. Experience is a good teacher. I was hired not just because of my academic endeavors, but because of my experience with living from, called today, living from and not dying from HIV AIDS. You know, because that's what I was saying, identification with the client um, on the other side of the coin, so to speak. You know, I was on the other side of the coin, you know. And so for the, the for my presence being in the room just to inspire them, you should see the joy that comes upon their face, the feedback that I get from my work phone to my work phone about how their day was made just by my conversing with them and, you know, giving a little joke, making them laugh, you know, bringing out the best of their smile. It works wonders. They may come in with a sad demeanor, but before they leave out of that room, um, after seeing all the other medical staff that, uh, that is required, they give a feedback on my phone about how joyous their experience was, that we made the best part of their day. Even if they came in with fear, they left out with some hope and faith. Experience is, is a good teacher. I've been there, been there. They did it for me, and I'm just glad to give back what was freely given to me. I really appreciate that, Robert. So we're down to our last moment, and I just want to really underline what Robert said. Uh, because, you know, so I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm a doctor, not a, not a person with lived experience, but, uh, but what I have seen and the people I take care of is that seeing somebody like Robert, who can say, I have been where you are, and I am now healthy and employed and alive and have joy and I'm living my life, that that is sometimes more important than medicine. They're both important, but I think sometimes having hope or a, a goal becomes more important than just the medicines. And it makes people able to take those darn pills every day because they wanna be where Robert is. So I really appreciate our conversation today. I think it was great. We are done for today. Um, we'll see you all in two weeks. Um, thank you so much to our presenters, uh, to Dottie and uh, Kamisha. Um, and uh, we will all see you in two weeks. Thank you so much.